Welcome back to A Lovely Jaunt where we read better, not more. Today I want to talk to you about a book that I just finished. This is The King's General by Daphne du Bourrier. Now this book I suspect is a lesser known title. This was actually a gift from my very good friend Emily who hosts the Novelty Podcast with me. And um, so I want to give a little bit of a summary because I hadn't heard of this novel before. So I'm assuming that there are some readers out there who haven't either. So this is historical fiction. It's set in the 1600s during the Interregnum, which is the period of time in England where Puritan Cromwell kind of took over the government and they dethroned the monarchy. And we get the battle that led to that defeat. We get the period of time during the Interregnum. And then we also get an attempt at a re reestablishing the monarchy. Our main character and first person point of view is a character named Honor. She is a young woman who tragically on the day of her wedding to Sir Richard Grenville has a tragic riding accident and loses the use of her legs and is, you know, a cripple and bound to a chair for the rest of her life. She is honorable and kind and smart. She is a wonderful, wonderful character. I really enjoyed enjoyed her and reading from her perspective. And the writing is also in keeping with de Maurier's standard. It is beautiful, it is well paced, there are great characters, and there is a lot of action in this story. So I think for people who are a little bit more plot driven, I think this is a great classic to pick up. Over the years of reading, I've developed a habit of once I kind of find an author that I like, I tend to read a lot of works in their canon. You guys know about my project to read everything written by Agatha Christie, which I'm in the middle of. And a couple of years ago, I did something similar with Edith Wharton. I haven't read everything written by her, but I read a lot like a couple of years ago. And I enjoy reading this way because I feel like it gave me a lot of insight into not only the style of a writer, but also what they are particularly interested in. What are the th the thematic elements or the, the topics that they return to over and over again? And so here are my observations, having read four or five de Maurier novels, like what I think she's into. First of all is Cornwall. A bunch of her novels are set here, but also a bunch of her novels are an exploration of Cornwall culture. And I feel like from what little I know about Cornwall, which is not much, and then also her novels, a lot of it is an exploration of this independent spirit that we see from the people of Cornwall. It's all, it's, they definitely have a strong identity as Cornwall, in addition to obviously being part of England, but it seems like Cornwall in a way comes first. It, it, they're very much like loyal to England. That's not what I'm trying to say, but that, that being Cornwall within England is a primary motivator for a lot of these characters and seems to be deep in this culture. According to the internet, uh, de Maurier moved there in 1920 when she was a young woman, and she must have just become enamored with the place, with the culture. It's kind of got that rugged British coastline. Um, it's really, really beautiful. But I think she must have been, she must have really fallen in love with the people as well as the landscape. Of course, you have mystery, discovery, you have a bit of a gothic hint to everything that she writes. And this, you know, it could be mystery around a sense of place, like what's actually going on in this house. But it's also mystery in terms of who, what is the history of these people or these characters? What's the unknown thing that happened before a character arrived on the scene? Usually there is a really bitchy, gorgeous female character who is a rival to our main point of view character. Rebecca, of course, is the most famous of these characters, and she's never even on screen. She's died before the novel even starts. But we have another one in this novel as well. And the the beauty of this character and the way that she has the attention and admiration of male characters is key to her stories. And even like how much the female main point of view character kind of is arrested by this character's beauty is, is a key component. And then we have siege and confinement. This comes up all the time, even if it's like, you know, again, in Rebecca, this sense of being kind of like stuck in this isolated house, you know, and not really knowing anyone, even if you're not literally, you know, sieged or like not allowed to leave, there's that sense of isolation in the King's General, because we're dealing with soldiers and actual siege, there is a, a literal siege in this book um, that the characters go through. Now, I think that if you like Rebecca, then my cousin Rachel is a really good pairing because they're more of like a matched set 
kind of unto themselves. And they're a little bit different. They're very, very similar to each other and quite a bit different and removed from some of her other stuff. And I think if you kind of read some of her other stuff after reading Rebecca, you might be a little bit disappointed because I think those books are so overtly gothic and the rest of her stuff is more like subtly gothic. So if you're looking for that gothic feeling, Rebecca, my cousin Rachel are, are really going to deliver on that front, but I think it's much more subtle in her other works. Another pair of novels that I think are a really nice matched set is The King's General, which heavily features, again, this strongly independent kind of Cornwall, but under siege, under oppressive rule during Cromwell's puritanical leadership, right? The other is a book called Rural Britannia. I picked this up at my used bookstore and just read it. Again, I had never heard of this title before. I don't think it's one of de Maurier's more famous novels. Correct me if I'm wrong. But this is a speculative book. In this, de Maurier imagines a scenario in the modern day where, again, Cornwall is has a sort of friendly, paternalistic military force from America coming to just make sure that everything's okay. And the locals do not respond well to this. These are such an interesting look at that independent Cornwall spirit where there's an outside force of oppressive rule in history and then also speculatively what would that look like in the modern day. Now I want to whinge a little bit about the romance. So uh, I have never been a romance girly. We recently did a podcast uh, episode about romance and I talked about it there. I enjoy a romantic tragedy. I can enjoy a romantic drama. I think Jane Austen is such a good writer that she supersedes her genre, and I will always love Jane Austen. I never enjoyed rom-coms when I was like even a teen. Even like the 80s and 90s classics from like the peak of Meg er Ryan era, I, I would watch these movies with my friends who would like love them, and I would walk away from them just being appalled at the relationships. They were so dysfunctional. The main characters were like especially the male romantic leads were some of the most awful people and they were like the relationships that should be red flags that you should forever avoid and you, you should not be romanticizing and I, and I would just would like walk away from these movies being like I do not find this romantic at all this is not at all something that I would ever want to wish on my worst enemy for them to be in relationships like this that's just at the core of who I am and I do feel like in my old age, my heart has calcified, has hardened in time. For the King's General, you know, the background of this story is the history and politics, but like the continuity is the romantic relationship between Sir Richard and Honor. And I just get a little bit frustrated because Sir Richard is really at the center of the story. And you know, I do want to say that all of this is like, historically, it's realistic. You know, this is very much like a Darcy Elizabeth Bennet type of class, but set in the 1600s. You know, Sir Richard is wealthier and of a higher standing, but they're both landed gentry and they're both from like upper class England, right? And to his credit, Sir Richard is a very interesting character, but he's an awful person. Meanwhile, Honor is amazing. She is the coolest. And on top of that, her life is already so interesting because we're watching this person who's disabled in the 1650s kind of like navigate life. But instead of the novel really focusing on her, so much of it is like she ends up being the Watson to the Sherlock, just this observ observation point of view while she watches Sir Richard go and do stuff. And my favorite parts of the book were when Sir Richard wasn't there because Honor necessarily had to be a much more active participant in the story and therefore in her own life. And I really enjoyed her as a character. So my favorite parts were watching her actually do stuff, actually figure things out, actually have a bit of an adventure, even in her own way, because I think she was the far better character and much more interesting. I also feel like this novel fails because there's a very little progression between how 18 year old honor feels about Sir Richard and 35 year old honor and like 50 year old honor, right? And the change in their relationship occurs with her accident. She feels very strongly that after she's become a cripple, despite the fact that, you know, they're not merely just attracted to each other, they really do have a, a deep compatibility and love for each other. and she does not want to marry Sir Richard despite this deep love that they have because she knows at some point he would come to resent her 
but not much beyond that shifts for her. And I just don't think it's realistic for a character like Honor, who is smart and savvy and wise, uh, would have the same feelings for a man whose flaws in his character lead him to make the same mistakes for like 30 years straight. There would be some diminishment in her respect for him, and that would very much impact the way or the degree to which she could love him. At some point, Honor as a character outgrows Richard, but that's really not reflected in the narrative point of view vis-a-vis -vis how her feelings of love for him are shown. I also feel like, and again, it's probably historically accurate, but kind of annoying to read, how much responsibility Honor felt for this man, who was never her husband, who was never going to listen to her, who had profound faults that he never made any effort to ameliorate. The fact that over and over again, Honor expresses this responsibility for the consequences of his pigheadedness. Over and over again, Honor narrates to herself that she failed Sir Richard at these key moments where she couldn't convince him to do or be better than who he was. And it's, it's even in the title, you know, the title of the book is The King's General. That's Sir Richard. Ostensibly, Honor is our main character, but the title refers to Sir Richard. The main action is Honor observing Sir Richard doing his thing. And there is no action that Honor participates in that doesn't have to do with Sir Richard's narrative, right? We don't get a sense of her life outside of what she's doing with Sir Richard or how she feels about Sir Richard. And ultimately, I think I would have preferred a novel that was about Honor, not about Honor watching Sir Richard do stuff. And I think that that is ultimately what makes romance so intolerable for me to read or watch. It is the way in which the male lead becomes the main character. He takes tenor, center stage. And the way that the female lead just becomes the lens through which we observe this character, right? That combined with the female lead's like lack of judgment, the male lead's lack of growth, the female lead's lack of presence in the story, which, you know, ostensibly is her own life. The female leads to take responsibility for the male's mistakes and the fundamental character flaws that he has. I just can't enjoy it. It's just really, really hard for me to align myself with that point of view and imaginatively, even when I'm reading or watching a movie, right? As an example, I was actually just re-watching an episode of Parks of Rec just yesterday, and one of the storylines in this episode is when Tom tries to like revamp the newlyweds game. Know your boo. And the first question kicks off an argument between uh, April and Andy, which rock star would your wife sleep with if she had the opportunity? And Andy says himself, because he's of course the lead singer and guitarist for his band, Mouse Rat, and April says the lead from her favorite band. And in the argument she says, like, I've told you a hundred times that this is my favorite band, I've asked you to listen to them and you never listen to them. And Andy of course takes it as a personal offense and, a, and he, he gets his feelings hurt. And the way that the story paints this disagreement is not even as like a mutual wrong, like April, you should support Andy and his band Mouse Rat, which she does. And Andy, you should take an interest in the things that your wife is interested in. The episode paints only April as wrong. And she has to lie, first of all, to protect Andy's ego and pretend like Mouse Rat is her favorite band, even though it's not. And Andy's forgiveness of her, he says, oh, that's my beautiful wife, she's really hot, and we're gonna bang that night. So he reinstates her into his wife, into his partner, again, attached to him and her, <laughs> now she can be complimented on her looks and her attractiveness, right? And then she has his guitar, he comes and takes his, the guitar, she hands it to him, he takes center stage, and she moves to the position of audience, just front row, admiring, looking at him. And I think romance over and over again uses the female point of view to establish a male main character, not only of the story, but of the woman's life. And it is just annoying. So that's all I have for you today. If you have any questions or comments, agree or disagree, let me know what you think of the romance framing and narrative point of view and the way, what I've outlined here. I think that's really the most important piece of what I've talked about today. I'd love to know your opinion. Leave them in the comments down below. And until next time, my name is Alexandra and I'm still a bibliophile. <laughs>